I got nothing. I don't know. Let's just start. I have no segue. I have no. Oh, let's no just see what happens. Point. Is it? Is there snow on the ground? I'll start with that. Jimmy, do you have snow on the ground? No, no. Thankfully, there was for a minute, but it's gone now. Thank God. It was. We had a blizzard last weekend for a few minutes. Suddenly, really? the wind kicked up, and I didn't. I don't check the weather reports all that often, but the weather kicked up. It was like Wizard of Oz. I I broke my camera out in case I saw like a witch fly by. The wind <laughs> kicked up. It was really you know the the the, the nature events up here are just unbelievable, and the weather kicked up. And I started filming, and then within 10 minutes of the weather kicking up, there was snow everywhere. It was pretty amazing. And then it stuck around, and it got increasingly worse and lighter, and then stopped, and now it's all gone. Hmm. But that's what happens. It comes in like a lion, goes out like a lamb, March. You know, I saw Matt Cremona posted yesterday or the day before or something that he, he lives up in Minnesota? Minnesota? Um he posted that like f- winter finally arrived and there was just a ton of snow. And I don't know if it was done snowing or whatever, but I feel like where he lives, it snows, I don't know, 10 months of the year. I don't know if that's the <laughs> truth or not, but that's what it seems like. The summer is about um, eight minutes. Yeah. So it, it was surprising to see him talk about like winter is finally here. You know, maybe they had more it's been, than it's definitely 10 been a inches mild, of snow. It's definitely been a mild, mild winter. And. Mm-hmm. You know, you get it gets to see up here. I don't know what it's like down there, but it's very rural. It's very like half the people that I know like drive on their grass to park, and there's no paved driveways and gravel driveways and stuff. And when you start getting stuck in the mud, that's when you know that like we mm. got stuck in the mud a lot during the winter when the ground should have been frozen. When the ground's frozen, that's when you move materials to the barn, and that's when you drive across your lawn to go do stuff and pick up chunk and whatever oh i see yeah but lots of times during this summer during this or during this winter me and other people i know get get their truck stuck in the mud because you you have this false sense that it's frozen there's snow on the ground but there was just like a flash freeze and then the ground just has frost on it but it's still muddy underneath Hmm. so that this winter is the first time i noticed that a lot and then in April, God forbid, it, the, all the ground up here turns into soup. If you go off your driveway or your gravel pathways, you need a tow truck to get out of it. I remember a couple of years ago, we got snow at the very beginning of April. And I thought that was really strange. It, I mean, you know, like a lot of places in the kind of, in our elevation, not elevation, but latitude, longitude area. Um, it's like, it just changes all the time. It's cold it's freezing and then the next day it's 70 and you know the rain and the snow they're all mixed together and so you never really know what to expect in this time of year but snow in april seemed like a big thing and now i'm thinking it's we haven't really had a big snow yet this year so i'm wondering if maybe <laughs> next week Still it's coming. just gonna hit or something i don't know last year i got a new battery powered snow blower because we have a really long driveway so when we get a lot of snow it sucks. Uh, and so last year I got a battery powered snow blower, same battery with all that that my chainsaw uses and my weed eater and and all excited to use it. I only had to use it once last year and I didn't really even need it. I just used it because yeah, <laughs> I had it. And then this year, never used it one time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yep. that's the way stuff like that goes. That's why I've never really bought a generator. I know I should and I probably will. But I, I've never had the occasion where we've lost power for more than a few hours at a time, much less like enough to where yeah. a generator would really be necessary. So if I, yeah. I bought one, I know it would just sit there and not get used, and it would force us to never ever lose power again. So I think so. yeah, that's why you need to buy it, just so you don't have the problem. <laughs> yeah. I need to buy some like internet backup so device, true. so my internet will stop going down. That would be nice. I guess they have yeah. a generator for internet, but that'd be cool. Ooh, there's my there's my product right there, a generator for internet. Oh, uh, yeah. What have you guys been uh, up to? What have you been working on lately? You go, Dave, and then I'll go. Yeah, uh, this week I am finishing up the my finished formula video. Oh, cool. I've been talking about Good. it for weeks, and this is the week I, I filmed it, so I'm editing it now, and it should be up. Should be out this weekend. Oh, well, are you gonna you doing a video about the finish that you we we prompted you to try and sell? Oh, cool. <laughs> yes. So convinced. I'm, I think that's. I am looking for the word convinced him to try to sell. 
Yes. Convinced, yeah, yeah, because I had no no intention. But of now it's selling it at all, yourself. and <laughs> well, I I, I, I kind of split the difference. Oh. So I'm only going to sell it to my Patreon oh, people. Cool. Oh, so the thought is, uh, I will. So it's a it's a it's a two step formula. You have the the finish, and then there's a wax, and I've got enough. I got 24 sets uh, that I'm almost ready to go boxes and everything and i'm only going to sell them to my patreon supporters and if those sell out i'm not sure that it will but if they do sell out i'll just i'll just make more and then uh i'm just going to gather feedback and and data for the next year and and see if people like it maybe maybe other people don't like it maybe um there's a couple because it's a wax and a liquid I don't know if I have the right ratio of wax to liquid, like container size. I don't know if the finish will separate, if it sits on a shelf for eight months or if it goes bad. So I'm just going to just gather information for the next year through people who want to support me. So Awesome. I hadn't thought about the fact that it Plus, might go bad, like because it's made out of, or I mean like shellac. Yeah. I'll, yeah. So shellac has a, a, a shelf life. The formula is only 25% shellac, so there's not a lot in there. And um, I don't know. We'll just we'll just see. There's a lot of unknowns. I don't want to sell it to the general public until I know for sure yeah. that it's good. And if I do decide to sell it to the general public, I probably will need to find somebody to manufacture it for me. And it's all safe. It's non-toxic. You can, you can lick it. <laughs> I Please say put that on you the can label. eat it in the <laughs> video, but I think I'm going to cut that out just to, just to cover my butt. Or just put, like, <laughs> don't actually lick it um, on the screen or something. You know? Yeah, don't actually lick it. Yeah. So. <laughs> that would be pretty great on the label. Like, you can lick it, but don't. <laughs> <laughs> I, did I tell you guys, that, you know. I'll, I'll uh, run that by the lawyers. Know, ZH Fab, he makes, a, he makes a shop oil now. It's like a general yeah. purpose oil. And he, he sent me the label yeah. and he asked me my opinion. He goes, it's non-toxic. He goes, it's safe to eat, but I don't want people to eat it. What should I say? I say, say it's, it's, it's non-toxic, but don't eat it. That's what I said to him. Yeah. And that's what he put on the label. So it says nice. that on the label. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. Not consumable. Yeah. The, um, the alcohol that I'm using in there is pure ethanol, pure grain alcohol that I got from a chemical supplier. <clears throat> and you, I, I've I've gone through various variations of this. I I usually you would d- dissolve shellac flakes in denatured alcohol. Denatured alcohol has poisons to so it makes it non-consumable so hardware stores can sell it. That's the purpose of denaturing it. And there's alternatives you can use like Everclear, which is 95% grain alcohol and that works great. You can't get Everclear everywhere you live. And even when I bought the Everclear from the liquor store, there's there's different grades. There's like a 75 and 85 and 95%. I got the 95% because it contains less water. And when I bought it, they said, you can't use this for human consumption. At the liquor store? And I'm like, I, yeah, I'm buying Everclear at the liquor store. And I had to sign a paper saying I couldn't use it for That's human bizarre. consumption. I, so some weird state law is about 95%. Yeah. Everclear, and um, and some states just don't sell it. Probably some countries don't sell it either. And so I went with uh, even a higher grade of ethanol, just going straight to a chemical company and getting a big five gallon jug of of ethanol, which is probably a fire hazard in my shed right now. But I guess <laughs> probably so is the gasoline container in there. Um, and so I'm using that, and I actually had to say. I'm not using this for consumption as well. So it's hmm. It's been an it's been an interesting process. This is probably the most research I have ever done for a video before hitting the record wow. button. Because I've done so many tests. Yeah, well, you, you need to get it right. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. I, I mean you've obviously and been using the, it, the the finish. Are you happy with yeah. it? Are you liking yeah, I'm very, very happy with it. Uh, I don't like my finishes super shiny, and this is not a super shiny finish. It is, 
it, it, it's funny. This all started when I watched this video about Thomas Moser. It's a, it's kind of like it's a furniture company. They sell high end furniture, and they ha- and they're is absolutely beautiful pieces, and their finishes are flawless. And there's like this little behind the scenes video, and they said, yeah, we have a two step process. It's we have a pr- pr- proprietary blend of boiled linseed oil with resins and hardeners, and then we do a second stage the next day of wax. And I was like, hmm, I've been spending four days on my projects doing the finishing. And they're only doing two days. What's And so I started doing research. And the thought, the original thought was I want something that's super easy. And then I found out that drying agents are very harmful. And so then I took a completely different path and just wanted to go down the super safe route. And it's still fairly easy, but it's it's not. You could probably buy something off the shelf that's better, faster, and more consistent. But it's cool that I made this. I came up with this. I know exactly what's in there. It's super safe. I can get it on my hands and not worry about it. And well, and doing something, you can always buy something cheaper, faster, easier. But having something that's purpose built, purpose made, yeah, is going to serve a different need it's going to serve a different group of people you know it's going to serve the people that have a specific use case in mind not are looking for the cheapest fastest option there are always going to be both of those right people, you know i think and so the video i'm telling exactly how i'm making it i if, if you can't get these particular chemicals uh or, or ingredients we'll call them ingredients chemicals sounds bad uh, if you can't get these particular ingredients here's the alternatives that you could do if you want it to be super safe use this if you want it to be cheaper use this i'm telling exactly how i'm making it and then if you're a patreon member you can actually buy it and save the hassle mm. that's cool man it's been a fun process i feel closer to <laughs> I, I just feel a little bit more involved in the projects that I'm making. I don't know if that makes any sense, but like I put a lot of effort into this thing that goes on every single one of my projects. So it just gives me that much more intimacy with, yeah. with what I'm That's making. Cool. That's interesting. I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, I mean, I guess you're, you're like front loading the work on the finish that will then be a part of most projects yeah. going forward. I mean, you'll be using the same, Huh. It it's uh it's like Matt Cremona. We we just mentioned him. He's cutting down his own yeah. lumber and drying it and doing all that. Like you can't get closer to your project than that. <laughs> yeah. You cut down this living thing and turned it into a beautiful piece of furniture. So it's it's sort of like that for me, but just on the back end. Yeah. The tail. That's end. cool. Wow. That's very cool. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing the video and I hope that the whole thing goes well. I hope it's. Thank you. Hope it makes you a million dollars. That's what I hope. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't even know that I'll, I'll, I'll actually sell it to the public. And secretly, and this is not even part of the video, but secretly, my, one of my favorite parts of this project is designing the label. I was going to say, what, what so did you call got, it? Do you have a name? Oh, I. I hmm, do I reveal make that? Make something. Here? It's make not set something in stone. and put this on it. <laughs> well, I bought cases of whiskey bottles. So it's going to go into a whiskey bottle and it's going to have like a a cork. And so I'm designing an old timey whiskey label for that. And I'm really enjoying the graphic design part of this process. And it's not even in the video. And um, I'm struggling with the name, but right now I'm kind of thinking wood spirits because spirits as in like alcohol or uh, I don't, it just, because it has that whole whiskey vibe to it yeah. so i like the word elixir so i'm um, and elixir just looks cool when you get into some old timey fonts and trying to make so i'm i'm still playing with it that could be a like a, a subtitle you know you know like the yeah the spirit's name being the big brand and then like a description of it with elixir in there that could be cool yeah those yeah. are both great yeah but don't drink it <laughs> but don't drink it yeah not for consumption that's really cool, man. I'm excited about that for you. Thank you, uh, Jimmy. What have you been? What have you been doing? I'm working on. Uh, had a Coughing. cough. I'm working on a utility cart for the Polaris. I have a a 570 Ranger Polaris that I bought 12, 13 years ago, 
still going strong. I think I've had one service on it since I bought a brand new one. I think it's time to change the oil. I have... <laughs> I, I bought all the parts to put together a cart, so the cart is going to be the size of a pallet. There are oftentimes I get deliveries down at the bottom of the driveway and I have to bring them all the way in. And what I usually do is I just throw a chain on it and I drag it and just drag it on the gravel. And so in this case, I'm going to have a fold-out ramp with a, with a ratcheting pull strap so you'll be able to pull the pallet up onto it. And then this way, once I get to the shop, I could probably undo the cart and use the cart as almost like a hand truck because it's relatively small so it'll be able to be pushed around easily and uh, so I'm just working on the intricate ins and outs of welding this whole thing up it's a lot of lot of material a lot of welding and a lot more problem solving than I thought even though ultimately it's going to be very simple looking no no uh, shock absorber or leaf springs I don't think it was necessary because it's just bouncing around my backyard and I'm not going to be putting any people or animals in it. So it's going to be a, a rough ride, solid, solid frame with wheels I got from Harbor Freight. So I'm just working on that. I'm just doing the details of that. And I didn't air. Or uh, no, they're, they're, they're good, strong rubber air tires and they got bearing head <laughs> hubs from online. With like a, yeah, there's a little bit of shock absorption. Yeah. In the tires, yeah, yeah, then. yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think it looked a little overcomplicated if I was going to put a, just leaf springs and stuff on it. But uh, yeah, so I'm working on that, and um, I've been doing some fun shorts. I got a Pegasus scroll saw, and a lot of people are like, I thought you hated scroll saws, I see and that. I do hate scroll saws. But this actually, when I used <laughs> this at WorkbenchCon, I was I was amazed at how smooth it is. It's got it must the stroke must be small. You can still lose control of the wood and it flops everywhere. But I've been really mm. I've been really trying to figure out the experimenting with. I've been actually cutting some stuff off camera and having some fun with it. But what's interesting is you could really make almost 90 degree turns in an instant. So that makes it interesting where you can cut out things without getting rid of any of the, like, the scrap between. So on a bandsaw, you obviously have to alleviate turns and stuff. So if you're cutting out letters, it all depends on the size of your, your, your pattern. But on the scroll saw, I've been experimenting with cutting small, intricate things, which is obviously one of the main purposes of it. So it is there is a lot of advantage over a bandsaw. The, the bandsaw has its reasons, and then this has its reasons. So I'm really just trying to explore, explore that. I'm having fun with it. I have a question. And this may be naive because I've only used a scroll saw like twice. Um, I know that there are different types of blades, some that will cut on the front and on the back, and then there's like a spiral blade. I assume you're probably uh, yeah, it goes using in a every spiral. direction, kind of. Yeah. yeah, is that what you're using? The spiral? No, blade? honestly, I don't. I don't like those type of blades because you. Oh. you I remember as a kid, my dad would buy those because I, I was always on the scroll saw when I was a kid. I never liked them because you really don't have good control. I guess if you were doing like doilies or like a real intricate ivy winding uh, organic pattern, which is what a lot of people do. I, I just don't like the idea of having to be able to cut in every direction. I personally like the bandsaw with, with the bandsaw way it's set up where you have the teeth on the front side of the blade and you have a little bit of a... A rudder is what I call it. The depth of the blade becomes your rudder. So on a scroll saw, it's the same thing. If the, the back of the blade becomes your rudder. So if you're trying to cut long straight lines, if you're trying to cut long straight lines with a multi-directional cutting blade, it's it's not easy to keep that line looking smooth and straight because there's no mm, rudder. That makes sense. You just you just it's literally it, like if your heart beats, your arms are doing this. And you're going to get that movement in the saw and the cut. Whereas if you have a fin on the back of the blade, you could kind of ride that fin and get a nice long straight cut. So it works the same way on the scroll saw for me. But so I how am are you using able very, to very make... thin blades. The blades are really, oh. really thin. Okay. So that's how you're able to get like the tight yeah. turn stuff. Yeah. Across. Even though even though they're extremely thin, maybe like under a sixteenth of an inch, you still can feel the difference of having a, that rudder and not having it. You know, when hmm. the blade is multi-directional, 360. I've used those blades, and I wonder if it's in the package they gave me. There might be one. So I'd experiment with it again. It's been so long since I used one. I mean, honestly, yeah. since I was a kid, it's been that long. But I just remember my dad being so excited. He goes, you can cut in any direction. And I tried it. I was like, I don't really like it. <laughs> I was like 13. 
Well, I mean, with your bandsaw experience and like the way that you have learned to get shapes out of a one edge cutting surface mm-hmm. and the, you know, having to turn on the movement and all that stuff. I mean, it makes sense that transferring that to the same type of blade mm-hmm. would probably be a lot more natural for you. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I'll experiment. It's, it's uh, The good thing, though, is that I'm having fun with it and it, just seeing what I can cut out. And it's fun making reels, and I'm sure they're happy. Bearwood products, I'm sure they're happy. They sent me a, the 30-inch, the 30, 30 inch, so you could put you can cut something that's 30 inches deep and spin it through the wow. neck. Mm, wow. Yeah, it's that's a lot nice. huge. Huh. Well, oh, and, cool. then, and then so the opposite spectrum of that I, and you know, I'm just clarifying this because I posted last night. Keith Rucker has restored this giant bandsaw that has four foot wheels. So it's like a sawmill. It's how big it is. It's the wheels are four feet, so the throat is four feet. So it's a 48 inch throat. It's about 12 or 13 feet tall. Keith Rucker restored that for me, and I bought it in his area, and he was involved. So he shipped it. He brought. He salvaged these bandsaws and brought them to his place. Said, "Hey, what if I combine the two of them, make one good one?" Because it was they were in a caboose factory from the turn of the century that was getting knocked down, and they, they were going to go to scrap. And it was in his area. He put out a call online. Anybody want these? Of course, I said I'll take them. And he was like, "I'll drag them to my place, and you arrange shipping." I said, "Sounds good." And while they were sitting there, he's like, "I want to restore one of these." And so he did. So that was two years ago. And now it's ready to go. And he's packing it up with my friend Jason. And they're going to put it on Jason's truck and bring it up here eventually. Jason's got to do some running around the United States. He's a big long haul trucker and delivery guy. So they put the bandsaw and all of its parts on Jason's truck. And I Instagrammed that yesterday. And a lot of people said, it's here, it's here, it's here. I'm like, no, 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 no. It's at the beginning of its journey. So it will be here. So going from the scroll saw, cutting little tiny mazes out, like, two inches <laughs> to being able to free sculpt on a giant bandsaw, which I'm really looking forward to. It's going to be fun. Do you, what, do you have like specific yeah. plans for what you're going to do first with that or like, uh, no, no, I'll, you know, I'll just I'll freestyle a little bit, get some feel for it and see what I can do. That's going to have like a one and a half inch blade. Cause it's, it's more of like a, like a <laughs> sawmill. Oh, and the blade is like, yeah, 20 I, feet I can't long. imagine tracking anything smaller than that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Keith did a phenomenal job. He's got 50 videos of him restoring all the various little intricate parts of that whole entire thing, finishing it, cleaning off. Does that hmm? does that need a specialty blade welded just for that? Particular I would imagine. Size? Yeah, it's not something you're gonna find at Harbor Freight, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> and for the tool nerds out there, it's a Fay and Egan bandsaw that was used in a caboose factory in the 1880s. And Keith did a beautiful job. It's all painted black and pinstriped and stuff. So that's going to be another prize possession. I'm going to probably put it. I would like to put it right where the pool table is. But <laughs> probably put it right next to the pool. Dang table. that pool table! I'll Can you right cut the, the pool, pool table, table in half on the band? <laughs> I probably could. <laughs> I could. I can cut at least four feet of it off. That's pretty wild. Yeah, it's uh, it's exciting. So that's coming. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, cool. So I'm looking forward to that. So I'm going to go from one extreme to the other. So in the video, maybe I'll I'll do like a comparison, like the biggest and the smallest. You should like mm. use them to make something for each other. Like scroll out a little mm. emblem that you then stick on the big thing, and then you use the big thing to cut out a stand for the other one or <laughs> yeah, something yeah. like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, that's really... a good idea. Out of one chunk of material. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to have a throat of like, I forget the throat is like 18 or 19 inches, maybe, maybe bigger. Wow. So I could resaw. Hmm. It's like a saw, it's like a sawmill saw. Yeah. And, hmm. and, and it's so big that the feet, it's, I'm going to have to put it on pilings. The feet are so that an operator can stand at the table comfortably. The wheel goes through the floor. So wherever it would have been set up in a factory, you would have had a hole oh, in wow. the floor so that the floor could... Yeah, kind of like the the bandsaw blade, the the bottom wheel would poke through the floor maybe thirty percent. And so the way Keith has been mooring it around his shop, it's on two big giant chunks of wood. Wow! So you have to step up on a stool to use yeah, it. Yeah, that's what I might. I might do that. I might put a stage in front of it. Something like that. <laughs> wow. Yeah, this is it's a big commitment. 
but it's, it's this is like Bob's 3D. But it's the cool, but it is the coolest <laughs> thing. Like the minute it popped up, everyone showed it to me a couple of years ago. Everyone's like, "You got to get." And then I, I said to Keith, "I'm like, I go, I'll take them." And they were only five hundred dollars for both because it was a two two frames, which is the big C frame, two frames, but only one of them had enough parts to make between the two of them. There was enough to complete one of them. So I have an extra frame. It's down at Keith's place, but the uh, when it popped up, everyone's like, "You need them," and so I said, "And I said, I definitely want them." And Keith like, called the owner of the building who was going to throw them away. He's like, "I got a buyer." He goes, "So it's too late." I was like, "All right, no problem." And then he called me back an hour later. He goes, the guy came to look at them and he realizes he has no idea what he's going to do with them. So it's up to you now. Do you want them? I was like, yes, I want them. Hmm. So the first guy got intimidated when he saw them in person. <laughs> and I still haven't seen them in person. I've only seen pictures of them. That's why you said yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because you exactly. didn't see them in person. Yeah. So, so like, I know anything can be moved, but mm -hmm. you're going to have to plant these, this somewhere mm -hmm. and if you're going to build a stage like it's kind of a commitment to where it yeah. lands do you yeah. have that figured out like what what's the plan there where's it going uh, i thought about putting it in the barn down the block because i could dedicate the whole there's a the the, the barn has uh two big spots to drive into and I'm not, I don't feel comfortable putting a truck on there because it's, it's got a basement. So you're literally parking your car on a, a wooden floor with a, with a basement. So I might park the bandsaw over there because this way it'll be completely covered all the time. I'll have plenty of room around it to run lumber through it. So, and, and I've been wanting to, I'm talking about the graveyard house. I've been wanting to put a sawmill there. And so this would be the beginning of having hmm. like the sawmill facility there. Being able to have it, like that does big band weigh, saw. Does it weigh less than a car? I feel like it yeah, would weigh yeah. a lot. I mean, yeah. <clears throat> no, well, like I said, the, the previous owner used to keep his pickup trucks in this barn. I personally just looks looks a little precarious for me. And I could also just shore up, go underneath the barn, go underneath the barn floor and just put some jacks right where it is. Yeah. <clears throat> so I, I would put it in there. It's about, a th the frame itself is probably 2,000 pounds. So Let's if you're doing that, if it's already got basement space underneath it, do you need to lift it? I mean, what, you have no, the that, and that, that's another reason too. I could potentially cut a hole in the floor over yeah. there and and have it be just like a proper. That, that I've, it's a good thing you asked. I mean, that's another reason why I'm thinking about putting it there. So it could be set up right in the middle. Every time you open that big door, it's like boom, right there, and it's like my giant cutting room for cutting big things. I could take big things over there and cut them there. And then there's a beautiful setting. It's all hand hewn barn from the 1850s. Mm. It's uh, it's really pretty over there. Oh, and then you gotta get this thing water powered, but get a stream going in the back. <laughs> yeah, right now there's a yeah. little puddle of a pond. And have to get the neighbors okay with running a stream through like seven properties. <laughs> how how was this thing powered back in the eighteen eighties? It definitely would have been run on a line shaft, no doubt. Definitely. And explain a line shaft to me. I mean I know, yeah. but in uh, case well, everybody else doesn't know. Yeah. You see the old factory pictures of all the machines being with belts that run up to one line shaft. So a factory would have a line shaft that could be 50, 70 feet long. And on it are pulleys. And the pulleys, in some cases, would like clamp onto it and bolt together. So you could put a pulley in any particular part of that line shaft. And that line shaft would run, in some cases, out to the outer part of the building. And that line shaft is powered by either a water paddle or a big diesel engine. So at the turn of the century, these factories would have one big diesel engine that would run that line shaft, and then all the machines mm. that would be lined up underneath it. And then the line shaft could run another line shaft. You could have an offshoot. And so you have these belts just rattling all day long. And then the machines would, would access that power by having an idler wheel and a running wheel. And then a lot, I have a printing press that has an idler wheel and a mm. running wheel. I have a drill press that has an idler wheel. And the idler wheel just f spins freely so the belt could still be tensioned. And then you push a lever and you just roll the belt or you, you coax the belt onto the running wheel. So a lot of these machines would have these mechanical switches that just push the belt on or off of the, the run wheel and put it onto the idle wheel. So you have these belts just constantly running. You could imagine the noise in these old factories. Can you imagine how many arms and fingers were lost in a factory like that? The tools themselves, plus... This yeah. floppy moving connection to this <laughs> giant rod that's running through an entire building yeah. is spinning. Man. Yeah. Whew. I saw I saw an interesting uh, 
picture. I don't. I, I, we could probably research it and find it. It showed a, a book factory, and you know the clamshell printing presses, like the, the the Chandler and Price printing presses that I have. The room was a floor of them. It was maybe seventy five or hundred of them going in like four rows, and all run off the line shafts, and people making what probably was amounting to like books. You know, so you have to print a lot, and then you. Then they have to print the backside. So there's this whole organization of how to print a book. And these clamshells open, and every one of them could just literally destroy your hand if you're not, if your timing is incorrect. Hmm. That's why those clamshell printers are put to pasture because they're too dangerous. Hmm. By the way, I, I'm having a conversation with a with a gentleman in Brooklyn, and I might I might get a 24 by 24 inch Vander Cook press. That's just that's that conversation started yesterday so that's a like do you ever see the, the hackshaw printing in in nashville hashshaw oh yeah where they yeah. run the posters and they go Phthunk! they like roll that thing across all the yeah. the blocks on the table the print blocks on the table it's that's how that's what this is i bought one a couple years ago but it came it was so rough i ended up giving it to ryan smith and he he restored it and he uses it but this one is in has been in good shape and is well used so i'm thinking about it Hmm. That means yes. That means yes, I'm getting it. <laughs> right, so at right. one point you were talking about moving all the printing stuff to the racetrack and kind of setting up a big print shop there. Is that still in the cards? or? Yep. Yeah, yeah, I did. I did move all that stuff last year. Me and Rob did oh. it this time last okay. year. But it okay. wasn't until about a week ago that I actually printed in there for the first time, just with life and logistics. And, you know, the, uh, you, you give your attention to different things and Anyway, I did, we did we did a special where we sold a bunch of posters on one of the videos recently, so I had to make a bunch of posters. So I went in there and kicked the dust off of everything. Rob got everything oiled up, and it, it's really nice printing in there. And if I get this machine, it'll it'll go over to that, that building as well. So, yeah, it's, everything's slowly moving along. Slowly. I want to come back to something you said there um, about, yeah. Uh, let me let me make a note so I remember to come back to it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I have been working. I actually have kind of not been working in the last week. I have. Mm-hmm. I've gotten some stuff done, and I'm working on the the next project video, which is actually three videos from now. And it's getting to be really cool and really weird that we have that much stuff in edit that many things done and now that I'm at the pace of every two weeks like that's a long time that I'm working on video that's not going to be out until the end of April early May or something and so it's it's kind of cool to have the freedom to to do a thing and then take a couple days to think you know like yesterday Mm. I had an idea I kind of talked about I think last time about rearranging the shop and creating some storage and creating the the room for the printers and stuff. Did I talk about that last time? Mm-hmm. Okay. So yes. that was a loose idea. And then I was trying to figure out how to make that into a video. So Forby and I had a big long conversation about trying to, trying to come up with a way to make a video that does the thing that I do in my head naturally around around organizing things. And I know when you look in my video here and you look at all the garbage behind me and all of the piles of stuff, it doesn't look like I have any any clue what even organization is. But the fact is, this is the result of organizing somewhere else. And so this is next, or this, this and the shop are the next things to apply this kind of thought process to. So we were trying to figure out, like, how do you make a video about something like that? And I asked a lot of people about you know, making videos about organizing things. And a lot of people pointed out that they love to watch Tested because Adam Savage constantly is talking out loud about how he thinks about organizing something as he's doing it. And I don't want to try to replicate what he's doing. And I have different opinions than he has about things. And, you know, we have different stuff in a different space and all of that. So it's not like I'm trying to take that idea. But a lot of people responded that they enjoy hearing what someone thinks about it so that they can figure out how to apply it to themselves. And so where about the shop where I I had been like going in there and just thinking and like trying to 
I think through all the options and if this goes here, then this does this and this has to have this and that goes there. And I, I think about all that stuff, but I had never like written it down. So yesterday I went in first thing in the morning and said, I'm going to write down everything I think about this. And I'm going to start over there and I'm going to go what it needs, what it has, what the problems are, what I want it to be, all of this stuff. And so it was really cool. It was really cool to write it down. And I have in front of me those three sheets, that sheet, that sheet. Look at that. This map of the entire shop with dimensions. It it was so cool to go in there with the intention of documenting what I was thinking. And it's kind of tedious because you got to think something and then you got to write it down in a way that you remember what you're talking about and everything. But to take the time to organize that stuff actually made it, started building kind of a system in my head. And I think that was the goal, was to how do I make a thing that's packageable that I could say, this is how I'm thinking about this. You can try this system as well. Or I can take this same system to my closet upstairs and figure out how to do the same thing with my clothes closet <laughs> or my, you know, the this one cabinet in our kitchen that just is where everything goes to exist. And so it was really cool to think through this stuff and start to like try to try to write it down and organize it and put some not giant words to things that describe them generally. <laughs> Cause I think one of the problems with people come up with like organization systems is they try to make it super abstract and it gets, they start using vocabulary that no human actually uses and stuff. And I don't want to do any of that. I want to be practical. So I'm trying to think of this thing and I got, I spent like half the day in there just doing this and, and making these lists and trying to figure out how to describe things and everything. And then I came in here and started taking those notes and then trying to put them in a big document so that I could organize them for a video. You know, just, you can't just like read the papers. It has to be organized in a way that a video would kind of flow. And then on top of that, trying to think about this video doesn't, it doesn't need to be punchy. It doesn't need to be fast. It doesn't need to be short. This is a thing that probably won't get a ton of views, but it has potential to just be a really long, well thought out, well organized thing about how to organize things. So it's a little bit meta in that organizing the video mm. is using the system uh, that I'm talking about. Um, so it's been really fun, but I think that all comes back to having the time to be able to do that is I'm very grateful the way things are for me right now that I have a day where I can say, I'm going to spend a day thinking and writing and I don't have to shoot anything and I don't have to make anything. And it's, this is on the way to those, but today is about just figuring out how to say it well, you know? And so, yeah, that was cool. You know, it was, it was a good, day to do that type of thing. And I hope to be able to do that type of thing on a more regular basis. I have been, I think. Um, but anyway, so that's what I've been doing. And the, the, another interesting side effect of that is that now that I have this kind of plan for, so th the overall plan is breaking the shop into three spaces, right? And so I've got these three spaces and what they need to be, what I have to figure out what I have to work around, all that stuff for each one of the spaces. And now that I've got that kind of in motion, I'm like, I want to go in there and build a wall. <laughs> I really want to go move mm -hmm. a thing. I really want to go throw this away, but I have to make a video about it. So I have to be calculated about, <laughs> I can't just go in there and do all the work. And then after the fact, be like, here's what I did. You know what I mean? You got to like, right. you got to get the before shots and you got to By the way, is that a light and, burn put? Is that a light burn pad that you're holding? Up? <laughs> it is. When I went to the light burn conference, we got a little swag bag with the <laughs> light burn <yeah>. logo. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny. Sometimes when you see a giant room and you think to yourself, there's no possible way like, cutting this room up is going to be uh, advantageous. And then when you cut the room up and put walls in it, you're like, oh my God, it seems like there's more room now than there was when there was no walls in here. Yeah. It's well, a really, and, it's and really crazy optical is, illusion. Yeah, yeah, and part of that is I look at um, I was noticing this in my space because where I'm gonna I'm gonna section off and I'm gonna put a wall, 
in that entire area, there have been, for about six months now, there have been things a waste level or below making that entire space useless. So it looks big because I can see at eye level across the room, but I haven't gone over there and done anything because I can't walk into it. And so I've proven to myself that the work that I want to do can exist in the place that it's currently existing. And that entire thing that even though I can see over there, I haven't actually used that space. And I know that that space can now become something else. And the walls that go up can be used, like you're saying, as a way to make the whole thing look better, to simplify. And this is one of the features that I'm trying to work in is like, how do I make this, the work that I do needs to be visible to to myself or to the people that are watching in the best way possible. And part of that is simplifying what's around them so that the focus stays on, I'm making this thing and not like this thing with all of this stuff in the background, because that's a really hard image for somebody to process well. So that that's one of the criteria that I'm working in and trying to talk about that criteria. So yeah, I'm, it's weird to think about taking a big space and breaking it up. And I, I know people are going to, some people will be like, you know, you're throwing away an opportunity to just have a big space, but a big space is, it has its downsides as well. So there's a, there's a whole thing uh, that I used to think about a lot in software and I'm sure people think about it in all different aspects of life, but separation of concerns where you, you say like this one piece of software doesn't have to do, it doesn't have to be a Swiss army knife. It doesn't have to do everything in a mediocre fashion you can separate your concerns and this one thing can be really dedicated to doing this thing well. And over here, this other thing can be dedicated to doing that thing well. And I think I'm trying to think about space in that same way, you know, that rather than just having one big Swiss army knife, I want to have a good knife and a good pair of scissors and a good this and a good that, you know, thinking about it that way. So I'm excited about it. What's the time frame on this project? I mean, I don't know. I'm like I said, I'm chomping at the bit to, to do it um, for a few reasons, but I think it's still going to take time to do. And also because we're ahead on videos, even if I finish something tomorrow, the video wouldn't go out until May, <laughs> which is like two months from now. So I don't know. I'm not really sure what the time frame is. I think the first mm. phase of, Making the video, cleaning things out, and organizing the wood shop area, I think that'll happen really quickly. I think that's a few days worth of work because there's not a whole lot of build that needs to happen in doing that. But that's the first step in making room for building a new room. And then once that room is there, then it's everything that's left over has to be consolidated into a storage system, which I have a couple of cool ideas about. So I don't know what the time is, but... um, I'm ready to do it. I'm ready to to get moving on. I'm excited about it, which is really cool. But that led me to another big thought. And this is where I want to tie back into what you were talking about, Jimmy. I'm working on, I'm working, this is the project that I won't explain, but this is the the project that I've been working on the last few days. And it's electronics thing and it's, it's cool and it's small and everything. And I put a little bit of time into this and it works well. And then my next thought was to move on to thinking about this big video. That's going to beget, beget? Is that a word? That's going to cause construction. And that's going to cause throwing away a bunch of stuff and sending tools to people that I know could use them more than I will use. It's going to cause all these other things that take time, that are stacked on each other. And so what I'm doing after this little one-off electronics project is I'm, I'm setting myself up for several months, probably worth of cool stuff that's built on top of each other. Right. But I'm already ahead. And now I have the next couple of months of potential cool fun. I'm enjoying this stuff to do. So if I come up with another idea, we're talking, I, I probably won't get to that idea for four months. And that kind of made me go like, huh, like being ahead is cool and having plans is cool, but it also doesn't leave a lot of room for improvisation and for, you know, 
I, I want to play music in this room. I can't play music in this room as it stands right now, which is part of why I'm doing this whole reorganization thing to move stuff out of here to make room to play music. But that means playing music is downstream of several months worth of stuff, you know? And so anyway, I got to thinking about this and I randomly ran across a video by this guy who I've never heard of. And it's a pretty good video. It's not a great video, but it's a pretty good video. It's interesting. The whole premise of it though is having having to deal with the fact that you you have more hobbies than you have life. <laughs> and so what you said a few minutes ago, Jimmy. Hello. Yeah. And I thought of all three of us because we've talked about this before. But what you said there was you said you hadn't gotten back to the printing thing because of I don't remember how you said it now, but life because of life and projects. because of just how things are. And so I kind of wanted to ask you guys about this because this guy talked about it. And I can tell you about that, but I've been talking for a very long time. So I actually would like to ask you guys about how you feel and if you have a, th a plan or a way to, to deal with the fact that as serial learners and people who create things, we will never, ever have enough time to do all the things that we would love to be able to do in life. Mm -mm. How much do you think about it's, that? It's sad. It is sad. I think about <laughs> it. I, it's it's depressing at times because there's all these things that I want to do. And, I mean, I'm sitting in a room full of instruments right now. And I do set aside time for that. But there's also, there's other things that I want to do. I've got a bunch of screen printing, screen printing stuff that I bought two years ago and did one project with. Thinking, I'm going to make this investment so I can do this a lot more in the future and figure out how to incorporate that into my woodworking. It's just been sitting on a shelf collecting dust. All the chemicals that I bought two years ago, they have a shelf life. They're no good anymore. So now there's a barrier for me to get back into screen printing because I have to buy new emulsion and, and, and all that. And that's just one of many things that I've invested time and money into that I don't do very often. And I don't have a good way of dealing with it. I do know that it makes me sad and excited to know that I could do these things whenever I want to. But I don't have a way to process how it makes me feel knowing that I don't have the time to do everything. Hmm. Part of the reason why I'm not going, I'm not going to Europe this year, and I'm not going to, I'm not taking as many trips as I did this last spring, is because I just want to spend more time here at the compound, just playing around, experimenting, doing pottery. You, you got to make time to, you got to make time to learn. And sometimes, uh, as I get older, I'm going to be 57 next week. I want to make sure that I'm spending time with the things that that I that make me feel fulfilled. And that's experimenting mm -hmm. with the materials I have around me and taking advantage of the, this environment I've created for myself and taking full advantage of experimenting more with blacksmithing, experimenting more with, they said, pottery and, and taking advantage of the welding equipment that I have. I, I really want to just delve into being more of an artist. I, I, I talked about this a little bit. I want to start experimenting with some abstract stuff. We did blacksmithing at the Blackthorn over the weekend, and and uh, I, I did make a draw knife, which I'm going to complete. It'll probably be a Patreon video, but uh, just experimenting with more of the freeform stuff, tying a tying a, uh, a railroad spike into a knot, which was fun. Draw it out and then tie it into a knot. Stuff like that is really exciting to me, and you just got to make time for it. It's just a matter of priorities. You know, I saw something the other day. It says. People, I forget how it was worded, but something to the effect of, not that you have time, it's just it's just not a priority. We have all the time in the world, it's just a matter of how you organize your priorities. Yeah. And, you know, I take a lot of trips, and there was a time when doing those trips felt like it was fun and learning and meeting, and now I really want to just focus on my, my skill set and take more time learning, meeting, and having fun with myself, basically. I think I thrive on the idea of potential. So having some of these tools, these toys is potential. And I just love. Then you got to, you got to, you got to, where the rubber meets the road, you got to do something with it. I, I have the same. Yeah. Feeling. You, I have all this stuff around me. I'm like, I have the potential to do anything. 
but I'm not mm-hmm. doing everything. I'm only doing mm-hmm. like 10% of what I can do. And the potential is all around us with materials and machines that sit idle and material that sits idle. We could do anything. We should do everything. We can do anything. And so care. goodbye, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, this video, so this channel is called Odysseus. I, I and I have no idea who this guy is. I don't know anything about him. I just watched most of one video. <laughs> um, and it's just him talking about this. Uh, let's see if I can find the name of the video. So at least that is how to manage multiple interests is what it's called. And it's got almost a half a million views. So it's, you know, a lot of people have seen it. But one of the interesting things he talks about in it is that he's talking about how, how you might spend your time. And one of the th- ways that a lot of us spend our time is we just end up scrolling on our phone and, you know, we look through a bunch of stuff. And that can be bad for some reasons. But one of the reasons that he points out that I'd never thought of that it is it can be bad is if you're looking through Instagram and you're you're watching these and, and people could say this about us as the subject matter too but if you're flipping through and you watch a 1 minute video of somebody making i don't know a thing out of pottery right a piece of pottery they start with raw clay and then at the end of this one minute video, it's a beautiful little cool thing. And you're like, oh, wow, man, I would love to be able to do that. And then you flip to the next one and it's a person climbing a mountain and it shows them training and it shows them preparing and buying this equipment and paying the money and climbing the mountain and summiting the thing. And you're like, goodness gracious, that's amazing. I would love to be able to do that. And then you go on to the next one and it's somebody beekeeping and you watch that's ah, cool. And you go on to the next one. And in the space of five minutes, you have watched multiple people show off the end result of a lifetime of work around a craft and you feel behind in that craft because you have never touched it and it would be cool you want to Mm -hmm. that desire is not bad at all but you're putting yourself in this position of i am so far behind on those four things that i just watched other people put a lifetime into and i was like whoa i do that constantly i mean just not even just with Instagram. I do that constantly. I look at the expertise that people have built throughout a lifetime and I'm like, I would love to try that. But a lot of things you can't just try. You have to really try. You have to try for a long time, (laughs) you know? Right. And it was an interesting just realization to go, maybe I should start thinking about when I see that type of stuff a little bit differently. I appreciate the effort that somebody put into that thing. And yes, I would love to try it, but I have to decide... Like, I'm, I'm, I may never be that person to do that thing. Or I may build it into my life going forward, but I can't do it all. And I definitely can't do it all well. So, you know, where I've, I've always wanted to go back to cello and actually learn how to play cello and not just mess with it a little bit. I have to kind of admit that I probably won't. Or I don't have to. When I've already put a portion of my life into piano and into guitar, and those things still need improvement. So rather than starting a new thing from scratch that I may never finish in the way that I want to finish, why don't I continue on in the things that I've already started? You know, and this is all a balance and everything's different and you can always start new tasks and and stuff. But it was an interesting way to think about it, you know, um, about the depth that's already in stuff that we see and how we just like, I at least naturally just stick it on a list of, oh yeah, this is the thing I want to get to one of these days. And then that list gets so insurmountable and unrealistic because that list is full of lifetimes of work that, you know, it's, it's a weird pressure that we might put on ourselves that we don't really have to, I guess is where I'm going. I don't know how to put this into words, but there's something, there's a, there's a negative part of achieving certain goals. Like when I was a kid and we had no money and we had no space to do stuff, I had these dreams of doing these things. Now as I'm an adult, I make money, I can afford to do some of these things, I have the space to do these things. The dreams are different because I know well, there's some, when you're younger, there's a barrier and you're like, maybe I'll never become 
this thing that I want to be. But it's mm-hmm. that would be really cool. And as an adult, I'm like, well, I have the resources to do it. Now I just have to tell myself to do it. It's like there's a there's a different motivation factor. There's some sort of like this it's priorities. My comes dreams back are to priorities. It comes back to priorities. It's just I just have to tell myself I want to do these these certain things and I can achieve whatever I want to achieve. I just have to I just have to do it. I don't know. I, it's just uh, dreams are different now as an adult than they were as a kid. Yeah, for sure. This guy goes on to talk about how, when you're talking about priorities, he goes on to talk about that and making the point that you can still learn a lot of things. You can have a lot of hobbies. They're just not all going to have the same weight in your life. I don't think he says that, but that's kind of what I took from it. That, you know, you prioritize the stuff like your health and, you know, if you have a sport that you do or music or something, that thing that's a part of you. It's like it's part of who you are. That's the thing that you prioritize, but there's always gap. There's always margin if you look for it. And then that's where you put in the little things that like, I can mess with a cello. It doesn't mean I have to be a good cello player. It doesn't mean I ever have to say that I play cello, but there's 15 minutes here or there where I could play with it and Mm -hmm. try it and, you know, do those little things. And he actually goes through the process of scheduling out his in like Google calendar scheduling out his entire week not by the minute but by the chunk by the you know I have to study this time and I want to read this time and I'm going to have to cook my own dinner and I have to do these things and then by doing that ahead of time in the week he sees these little gaps and he's like oh okay cool there's there's 15 minutes right there that I can dedicate to learning illustration or he, he he's learning violin so it's the same kind of thing you know you find these little pockets where if you don't have it scheduled out then you will or at least think about that, that time will disappear to scrolling your phone or it will disappear to some task that is not something, it's not a priority, it's just a thing that you end up doing, you know. And I don't think I'm the type that would actually schedule out my life to that extent, but I I can see how it would be really useful if you are really trying to fit a bunch of stuff in, you know. Um, I think one of the things that in the last year or so that I've really tried to make is margin in my life so that I have free moments naturally, that I have some space that is not spoken for by me or by anybody else so that I have just some more of those spaces to think or to play music or to not do anything at all, you know? Right. It's just kind of a neat thing. And so that's just been my take on it. But I don't know. I I have, I'm like you, David, in that I've always been saddened a little bit by um, the fact that, (laughs) the fact that we're not immortal. I've always been saddened (laughs) by, we, we, we really have a limited amount of time. And the more we try to enjoy the life, that we have and the more stuff we try to experience the the less of that time is available for more experiences and it's it's a weird you know it's like the sleeping thing i think we talked about sleeping a while ago i hate the fact that we have to sleep eight hours a day i hate it it's so much of our day but man i love sleeping you know it's like right and it's sad to me that we have to spend so much of our time doing that thing but while i'm asleep i love it so and tell me if you have the same feeling as I get older, I start thinking more about the present instead of the, the, the future, because the present becomes more important as we get older, because there's less of that present time left sure. in the tank. Mm-hmm. And so like, oh, yeah, I'm taking better care of myself so I can enjoy more of this yeah. and be able to physically do what I want to do. And, uh, you know, uh, as a, as a teenager, it's just like, I just want to be this when I grow up and I want to do all these crazy things. And, 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 uh, it, I just see the world differently now. Like I want to enjoy today. Mm-hmm. We're going to go see a movie because I want to hang out with my wife and, and enjoy this moment right now instead yeah. of thinking about the future all the time. And, and, and that's a great way to combat the sadness of not having enough time to do all the stuff you want to do. Right. You know? 
that's that's a really good point. Um, if you're thinking about right now and enjoying this moment, then it's not that big of a deal that you don't know what tomorrow is, or if you ever get to learn how to skateboard or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Right. Speaking of skateboards, <laughs> I saw the video of yeah. your buddy s- skating on your awesome skateboard. Man, he's good. Did he good, destroy he? it? Yeah. <laughs> he so it did it did uh, it did break. So I, uh, I we went to the skate park, and I said if it breaks on camera, even cooler because yeah. it's just it's just gonna look cool. And uh, he's just like okay. And then he did all these things, and he was absolutely um he's so skilled and was just uh, blew me away. Everything was just filmed on my phone just using the this i didn't take any fancy camera equipment just used my phone and recorded some high frame rate stuff and the board did split um at at one of the angles he landed on on something and he heard it crack and i was like ah he's like ah, it's still it's still good i can still do what i what i want but it did split in the in the laminations and i'm like well let's try to break it he's like all right let's see if i can do something where i land on it and it splits and he tried and, and couldn't do it but oh, wow. it came out so cool it's it's only 30 seconds of the video 38 seconds of the video but it's my favorite part because i think you know uh, uh in my time growing up it was just as cool to film skateboard skateboarding as it was to actually skateboard like the filming part was part of the the culture of grabbing a big camcorder so i got to i got to do that and it was so fun and the skateboards came out amazing yeah they look really or the one i saw on there looked fantastic that's that's pretty great thank you cool well i didn't mean to derail from the conversation about skateboards but it was a good segue there uh, any Squirrel. other thoughts on on like running out of time or <laughs> <laughs> as we are running out of time yeah. for this podcast. <laughs> well, I always say, if you have an impulse, just act on your impulse you know, as long as it's positive and learn and, and worthy of learning something. If you have an impulse, go for it. I mean, I see a lot of guys in the maker community that are uh, for, for rational reasons are timid to get involved because they have jobs and children and college tuitions and stuff. But if you have an impulse, <clears throat> at least give it a shot. Give it an attempt. Go to a class. Take a class at a local welding school or whatever. Or just it, my whole life has been impulses. Like when I see something, I'm like oh, 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 what is that? I want to try that. You know, your curiosity gets piqued, and you feel drawn to to do something. My my advice is do it. Even if do you it. spend one day doing it, you know it's funny. With my dad, I credit my dad a lot with you know where I've gone in my life. My dad always had those impulses, and he always act, he didn't act on them fully. He was a little timid, but I remember when my dad got a computer. I was like, "What going to do with a computer?" He goes, "Play games." Like, what I don't. It's, he was. This was in like the end of the eighties, beginning of the nineties. He bought a computer from Radio Shack. I'm like, "What are you going to do with that?" Like, what do you need a computer for? But he got a computer and he he was collecting all of his icons on his desktop of like the games and the little hacks and the stupid. You remember in the back in the the beginning of the computer, like they were all, uh, I guess, the programs and he was trading programs with a couple of his nerd friends. He he didn't know what to do with any of it, but he loved collecting the. He was a hoard. Hmm. He was hoarding. His desktop was hoarded with programs and hack things he's like look hmm. at this thing and you could do this with that so i mean i just I, I i was very impressed at the time with my dad's impulse to get a computer and follow through with it instead of being like hmm. i should get a computer nah i shouldn't get one it's going to be expensive and i'm not sure what i'm going to do with it he had an impulse he got it and obviously you know the entire world had that impulse but he was the first person i knew to get a computer with no real reason to use it hmm. and you know here we are 30 years later and it's like Making a podcast on a computer. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's, uh, you, you got to be careful. Like Bob mentioned, seeing something on Instagram and you're like, that looks amazing. I want to do that. And they spent a lifetime building those skills to do that. So things take time to yeah. develop. Bob, I don't know if you remember this, but we went to one of those video conferences, VidCon or something, many years ago. This is probably eight years ago now. And I remember these two guys. I think you were right next to me when when they came up, and they're like, "We haven't had a video pop off yet." 
we've been making videos for like three months and none of them has popped off. And I just remember thinking, oh my gosh, it takes so much more effort and, and time <laughs> than, than that. And um, I, you, you just have to realize like things take time. Skills need to develop. And it's amazing when you, I think we've talked about this, when you, you try to learn this new skill, whether it's sewing or leather or whatever, and you do the thing and it doesn't come out the way you want that day. And then for whatever magic happens when you sleep, the next day you do it, something clicks and you just, and you just get it. And you need, you need many of those days for, for something to really develop. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Jimmy, I th- you said another really good thing there even if it's just for one day, I think Mm -hmm. following those impulses, trying things that you want to try, giving something a shot. It's, I think it's almost always worthwhile and you don't ever have to do it a second time. You don't ever have to do anything forever. The people that are worried about, you know, doing videos or content creation or whatever, because of what it might cause them or what it might require of them. Like you don't have to do anything forever. The biggest yeah, hurdle anything. to entry, the biggest hurdle to entry is just doing it the very first time. I mean, mm-hmm. let me ask you three guys, uh, you two guys, there's three of you guys in front of me, but there's two <laughs> of you guys I'm talking to. <laughs> when when you have a video pending and you know you got to make a video, maybe it's just something you want to do and it's like one of those things in your notebook like when I did the chain. It's not for any reason other than just an impulse. And shooting that first shot, even if it's you looking in the camera going, today I'm going to make a utility cart that holds a pallet because I just watched that edit I'm doing myself. That, you're like, ah, oh, I could breathe a sigh of relief. This has begun. Now I can do this. Mm-hmm. Now the, the now I can do it. Where it's the build up to being like, when is the right time? Oh, the mailman's coming up the driveway. I was about to start. Up, oh, oh, there comes another FedEx truck. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, hey, what's up? I didn't know you were going to visit. And then when, like, you find the window and you get started. You know, All I have to do is just, I, I just need to run, I just need to get started. I need to run this board through the planer. I don't know what step two is, <laughs> yeah, exactly. but if I just run this board through the planer, exactly. it will come to me. Exactly. And then once you do that, it's almost, you, you, you've been let out of your own personal jail. Mm-hmm. Your creative, your creative uh, lockup. We put ourselves in because we don't want to fail. We don't want to mess up. We don't want to do something wrong. We don't want to. It's maybe this. The, even while you're starting it, you're like, is this worth my time? And then when you do the first thing, you're like, this is going to be cool. You can believe that. You know? <laughs> but getting past that, that getting, you know, breaking the ribbon is hmm. it's the hardest part. Yep. Yeah. Cool. That's why I say, do, if you have an impulse, do it, even if it's just for one day. Yeah. Right on. Well, I'm going to thank our Patreon supporters um, because they're awesome. We're really grateful for them. As always, uh, big thanks to the top supporters over there. Nick Ryan, Corey Ward, Albers Woodworks, works by Solo Chat from Minecrafting, Chad's Custom Creations, Rich at Lowen Design, Odin Leather Goods, Sean Beckner, Scott at Dad It Yourself DIY, Jeff at the New Janky Workshop, Warren Works, Michael Manegin, and Crabtree Creative. But everybody else over there at all the different levels, we're grateful for all of the support and everybody over there gets the after show, which we will record after this show. So Mm -hmm. if you want to get that, if you want to help out the show, you want to keep the show going. If you like our weird, long, random discussions, (laughs) awesome. Go to patreon.com slash making it and, uh, and help us out. We would be very grateful. We didn't talk about Jack Conte's converse, his South by Southwest talk. Yeah. That's what I was going to make a record. I mean, I think all three of us would recommend that. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. you talk about it then, Jimmy. I watched it and, uh, you know, Drew sent it to me. I'm not up on South by Southwest as much as I probably should be because I know there's a lot of good content creation stuff going on there. And uh, so Drew sent the, the video over to, to me and you, Bob, and then we sent it to Dave. But Dave had already seen it because Dave's, Dave's hip. And Jack, uh, <laughs> I don't mean I mean that as a compliment. Uh, Jack Conte talked about content creation and how the algorithm chooses things that get attention and versus things that are valuable. And and he he basically it, it almost made me cry. It was it was he's yeah. just so passionate. I mean, he's just it was a really good talk about it. Really hit home. It, it, and he's. It was a big commercial for for Patreon at the bottom line, but 
talking about how uh, you know what's next. I got I really got to watch it like three more times. <laughs> but basically, how the follow changed the world, and then now how ranking is changing the world. F- the follow, he said, he talked about a time when the internet didn't have follows. And then he was just a small little rock band, him and his wife. And then by gathering followers on YouTube, he was able to build an audience that would show up wherever he went versus him just going to a bar and playing and hoping somebody comes. And how it changed his life and how it's changed all of our lives, really. But now ranking is like the latest version of where, you know, it's why my YouTube videos get 50,000 views, where they used to get 250,000 views in the same amount of time. Because it's just not being pushed because, you know, the, the window of curiosity is narrowed versus so he's really pushing the idea of true followers what is what patreon is is becoming true well it is true followers what is your true followers people that really care about what you have to say and you know the lifetime worth of experience you put into something and people can really understand and get that and and the value of that and uh, i was talking with rachel because we listened to it together while we were preparing dinner and after we were just discussing it, I said, you know, it really, I'm glad I'm not chasing views. I'm glad I'm not, I really feel good about myself doing what I always done, making things that I need for me as if, you know, I don't want to call myself a homesteader, but somebody that creates the things that he needs for his own personal environment and being able to share that versus, you know, oh, look at this chair. It stands up on three cables. How has that mystery happened? Let me make my own version of that. You know, like, that's because people would do that because that's a popular weird thing that's like a magical chair. Let me make my own version because people are just chasing what might get picked up to go into the stream of multiple views. Yeah, I mean, I would like for more and more people to watch because eyeballs translate into my salary in in a weird meandering way. So when you don't have as many eyeballs as you used to, you feel like, oh boy, is my salary going to be depleted ultimately some way down the road? Uh, but my in my heart of hearts, I'm happy with the things that I've been making, and I and and I always have always made, and that's because it, it's really it's true to me. It's I'm not I'm not making a video on you know something to chase something. That's it. Yeah. All right. Is that is that right? Yeah. That, that was yeah. No, it is, it's, yeah. it is dead on. I I would recommend any talk that and Jack has done a few of them. They're all really good. He has a different perspective on creativity and being yeah. a creator, and yeah, he's he's just really good. All his talks are well thought out. It's fun. It's funny. I, I I hate to even admit this. Sometimes I don't want to watch them because I'm afraid of the truth that I'm going to be told. You know. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, I feel that. Yeah, you know, you're like, ah, I don't, do I really want to confront this turmoil? I, mm-hmm. I'd rather just keep it underneath the mat. <laughs> right. And there, there's also a there's a I've felt this comparison. I put this comparison on myself when watching him that I don't know that I will ever be as passionate about anything as he is about everything. I mean, other mm-hmm. than my kids, you know, like. He is just you are. you are. He just has he just has like the floodgates are open for his passion to express it. Yeah. Yeah. You know. And I don't mean that in a negative way. It's just that yeah. that same like I don't know if I want to watch this because like he's just going to make my heart explode. <laughs> he's like <laughs> he cares so much about this stuff. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm with you. Anyway, David, what you got? Uh Daisy Temp- Tempest. Uh I I've been Gathering information on making an acoustic guitar slowly. I don't know if it's going to be a video within the next couple of years, but it's a it's one of my goals of mine is to make an acoustic guitar, and a lot of the work is in the prep. You, you so I got a bunch of so good at it. Thank you. So I got a bunch of books. I got four different books from the library to see which one I like best, and then I'm probably going to buy the one that I like best. But I've also done a little bit of research online and daisy's channel came up and she's just an amazing guitar maker and i can't believe i didn't know about this channel so that is my pick also if anybody has a really good step-by-step i will pay for a an online class i will buy a dvd set but i i'm looking for a really good acoustic guitar class that i could take 
So if anybody has any suggestions, let me know. Awesome. The problem with the here's what I've here's what I've gathered from the the the, the books that I borrowed from the library is it's like we're gonna make a guitar. Here are all the choices and all the different routes that you can take to make this guitar. I don't want all the routes. I want somebody to tell me exactly how to do this particular thing and move on to this to the next step. I don't. I I I, I want somebody to kind of hold my hand throughout the the whole process. I don't want choices to be made. Yeah, uh, I have a few things like that. Yes, <laughs> I would like that too. <laughs> um, I've been looking while you guys were talking for this this account I found on Instagram, and I just found it, which is just in time. So I have two things. Um, this guy's name is Kale Helzen. Maybe. I don't know if that's right. It was another one of these, like I've had the last few weeks, these random Instagram accounts just get pushed up to me. And I saw this guy. He's a painter. And he's colorblind. And his painting is just wild the colors are wild awesome wild and i don't know enough about him to know how he is choosing these colors or like how severe the color blindness is or anything like that but there was a reel where he was saying as a colorblind person i never really thought i could paint and then i started painting and then this is what it became and you know and it was just like whoa and so i'm trying to surround myself visually with more of this type of stuff, stuff that I wouldn't even think of the, the color theory and the way that these colors work and the visuals is just stuff that I wouldn't ever encounter otherwise. So I'm trying to put more of that and graffiti and just outside influence in my feed, you know, art or uh, art wise to try to just, I don't know, spark some new stuff. So this Mm -hmm. is one of those accounts. Um, the account is called art by Kale Helzen. Um, so, yeah, it, it's pretty awesome. The other thing is Tyler Bell bought a bomb disposal robot from the Army, and he made a video about it, and it's really fun. Yeah. It's, it's, I saw, I saw the Instagram version of it. <laughs> he, he has so much fun, like, making silly, like, skit stuff around the, the things that he's working with. And this one is about him testing this thing out. He didn't even really make anything with it, but he makes some really funny little bits using this robot. And I am I, excited to see what he does with it because I think it'll be pretty awesome. But, yeah. So go check both of those things out. Uh, I, just sent you guys, I just sent you guys a picture of the band so that Keith just posted. Yeah. Because it's it, was a, it was a little kid. He, he basically is like, everyone keeps asking me. They can't see a clean picture of it. So here. So. Man, that looks slick. Yeah, six, Is it's that a, like a pinstripe down the down the curve, like a yeah, white yeah, pinstripe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had a pinstripe and everything. Awesome. Mm. Cool. So you cool. see Stunning. how much the wheels going to stick through the floor? Yeah. Oh yeah. It's going to be exciting. <laughs> yeah, that's exciting. <laughs> exciting. That seems like a huge pain in the butt to me, but what? Do I- <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, what? all right, cool. Well, um, we're running long, so let's go to the after show, shall we? We shall. Yes. Okay. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thank you. And uh, thank we'll you. Catch you next time. Love you. Love you. <laughs>